I returned recently to Iraq. I'd been here before, in 2003, working as a British diplomat and as the deputy governor of two Iraqi provinces. From this day is the real beginning of the transition to a free, independent Iraq. Talking to American soldiers, I've been intrigued to find that before they're posted to the Middle East, officers are made to study one of my boyhood heroes. In World War I, Lawrence of Arabia united feuding Arab tribes into a formidable army which helped to topple the Ottoman Turkish Empire. His experience of defeating a foreign military occupation, of leading an insurgency, has led to him being held up as the man who cracked fighting in the Middle East. So today, his writings and thought have become a guide to the US military and its allies fighting in Iraq and Afghanistan. One of the, the key things that you could take away from Carl Lawrence is he had an appreciation and knew the people. There's just incredible and valuable lessons that we have taken from that. But for me, Lawrence has a much darker message. Lawrence might have won a war, but the politics that followed fatally undermined his success. He aimed, he said, to write his will across the skies and build a new independent Arab nation. But in these two films, I want to show how Lawrence felt his dream ended in catastrophe and shame. And I believe that if our generals and politicians now could see what Lawrence saw, we would not be in the mess that we're in today. For three years, I've been based in Afghanistan, working with a community to save and restore part of the old city of Kabul. But at the same time, not far south of the capital, there's war between the Taliban and Western armies. I struggle to reconcile this conflict with all that I find so positive and entrancing about the cultures of the Middle East, all that I've seen in the last 10 years that I've spent living and working in this region. And in Lawrence, I found a man who experienced and understood many of these same issues. Reading Lawrence has taught me much about the risks and challenges of trying to intervene in a culture that is so alien to your own. Lawrence, the warrior hero, started life a long way from the deserts of Arabia. Born in 1888 in a middle-class suburb of Oxford, he eventually went to Oxford University. When I myself was at Oxford, I often thought about Lawrence, about how a shy, reserved boy began, before the age of 18, to prepare himself to be a leader. You have to think yourself back to that period when Britain was an imperial power, when young middle-class Englishmen and upper-class Englishmen were being brought up to run the empire. Jeremy Wilson is T. Lawrence's authorised biographer. He had a very, very profound sense of right and wrong. I think that just shows through everything he does. I think that aspect of Lawrence must have formed really quite early on. Lawrence had certain gifts. Uh, he was able to manipulate people extraordinarily well, and to manipulate people extraordinarily well, you must have an ability to size them up almost instantly. But it's a gift, that business of being able to put people in your pocket. It's a mixture of charm, it's a mixture of analysis, of, of um, hunch. For me, there's another vital clue in Lawrence's early years. 
that hints at his desire to change history. Lawrence seemed to his school teachers a relatively ordinary if eccentric bookish boy. But there was something very strange about his interests. He was obsessed with knights in shining armor. He cycled around the country doing brass rubbings of crusading heroes because he wanted to emulate them. He wanted to compete with them. He wanted some of the glory of being a knight in shining armor. Lawrence was not an accidental hero. He was someone who set out quite deliberately to become a hero. In 1909, when he was 20, 21, Lawrence walked a thousand miles across Syria and the Middle East, a tough and dangerous journey during which he studied crusader castles for his university thesis. He began in Constantinople, then the capital of the Turkish Ottoman Empire, and walked right down into Ottoman Syria. It was on this trip that Lawrence discovered the landscape and, more importantly, the people that came to dominate his life. Lawrence spent a lot of time walking through the Middle East. He was often doing nine, ten hours a day across the landscape of Syria and Palestine. Every night, he was staying in a different village hut, sometimes in a Bedouin tent, and they'd never take any payment for it. He was a kind of wandering mascot, I suppose, or must have seemed to them, this blonde English boy in his formal British clothes. Sometimes he'd aim for a crusader castle, but often he'd be sitting in a tent on a village floor, listening to people talk about their lives, talk about the government. By the end of it, the shy young undergraduate in Oxford had found himself. I can relate to Lawrence's experience. I walked from Turkey to Bangladesh when I was 26, which took me about 21 months, and I walked about 6,000 miles. And I stayed in about 500 village houses on the way. These are random places that just happen to be 20 or 25 miles apart. I walked across Afghanistan shortly after the fall of the Taliban through villages 10 days' walk from the nearest road. I had some difficult experiences. The man on my right in this photograph tried to shoot me for a bet. But Afghans, in their dignity, taught me a great deal about how to live a meaningful life, and they protected me. I found when I returned to the government, when I returned to working with the Foreign Office and with the military in Iraq, that I'd learnt an enormous amount. The fact that these communities are extremely generous, often very honour-led, but also surprisingly conservative, religious, anti-foreign. I think there are elements of emotional, spiritual motivation in this my sense that I'd left a line of footprints for 6,000 miles behind me across Asia. And also, I think, certainly for Lawrence, walking through the Holy Land, an echo of the Crusades of the disciples of Christ walking across the Holy Land. He arrived here in June 1909, the Syrian castle of Crac de Chevalier, which he called the greatest castle in the world. When Lawrence comes here as a young man, to get here at all, he needs special passports and permissions coming from Istanbul. And it's dangerous territory. Often the Ottoman police are stopping him from investigating things. And when he goes off on his own, he gets beaten up. This is contested territory even today, a central strategic point for the Knights, Lawrence's boyhood obsession, who came to conquer and hold the Holy Land for Christianity. It's a central link in a chain of castles stretching across Syria, which for three centuries they held against the local Muslim population. The 
size of the stones, the tens of thousands of people building this building, the amount of lives, money, energy, fanaticism poured into this kind of occupation. I mean, you can sense here in Crack the Chevalier why the Crusades is such an astonishing phenomenon even today. crusade, this war on terrorism is going to take a while. And the governments of the West were responsible for what he called a crusader campaign against Muslims. You can see why Osama bin Laden is obsessed with the crusades, why George Bush refers to the crusades. The scale of this occupation, the amount of investment, this isn't porter cabins and barbed wire. This is massive blocks of limestone, tens of thousands of workmen, 75 years building this castle. So Lawrence, as he's moving around, putting himself into the mindset of the people who built this castle, trying to understand how they defended themselves, is already beginning to think about the link between occupation and local populations. And the terrible tragedy the surreal weirdness of foreigners trying to cling on to an alien land. In Lawrence's time, of course, Syria was under another form of occupation, the rule of Ottoman Turks. Muslims, but not Arabs, ruling despotically over a vast Arab empire. Lawrence saw day by day the repression of Arab culture and sensed the Arab longing for freedom. But it was, in his word, only a dream because their spirits were shriveled under the numbing breath of a military government. Lawrence's first job after university was in Syria, where he worked in a remote area as an archaeologist. Archaeology was very different in the Middle East then. You had a small number of foreign archaeologists and a huge, great native workforce. And Lawrence's job was to manage that workforce. So he becomes an Arabist. He learns the language, he's immersed in the culture, he's learning about the Syrian tribes. He comes to identify very strongly with the Arab world. Today, this team of British archaeologists are excavating the site of an old Ottoman Turkish garrison. And, and this thing? That's a Mauser bullet. So this is Turkish? This is Turkish. That is First World War munitions. Yeah. We get lots of that. Amazing. While Lawrence was digging ancient objects out of the ground, Europe was hurtling towards the First World War. The Ottoman soldiers that he met were not only controlling the Arab populations, they were about to ally themselves with Germany against Britain and France. We're looking at the Ottoman Empire, a decaying empire, an empire which is under attack from other empires, other great powers, and we're also looking at an empire which faces revolt from within. This was a fort from which the Ottomans tried to occupy a vast desert landscape and subdue the nomadic Bedouin tribes. This is called uh, Batan al Ghul in Arabic, which means the belly of the beast. This is a place where you move from the relative safety of the uplands over there down into a bandit country, where the possibility of Bedouin raiding becomes a real threat. And I sometimes wonder what was going on in the minds of those uh, Ottoman boys or Turkish boys. They found themselves in this very bleak landscape a long way from home. They found that they were hated, they were unwelcome. It must have been as miserable um, as the Western Front was for British and German and French soldiers in a very different way. You can see, just watching these men, how much Lawrence learnt from being an archaeologist, gaining a precise eye for detail, for geology, for topography, the experience of years working alongside and managing hundreds of Arab labourers. 
the landscape has the same effect on a soldier it does, as it does on an archaeologist in some ways, because it is to, an, to a soldier that comes from, say, Manchester or yeah. London, or even from, you know, sort of Denver, Colorado. Coming out here, it is such an alien landscape, and and the landscape teaches you. You, you can either learn from the landscape or you can fail. And if you if you fail, then you shouldn't be an archaeologist. And it's probably the same thing with a with a, with a soldier. One of the exciting things about doing modern conflict archaeology in the Middle East is it resonates with the present. And there's a sense in which you can see in Iraq and I think also in Afghanistan that uh, a modern empire, the American empire, is facing insurgency and a kind of asymmetrical warfare which is just as difficult for the Americans and the British to deal with as the insurgency that the Ottoman Turks were facing 90 years ago, dealing with um, the Arabs. By 1914, Lawrence spoke good Arabic. He'd done some remarkable journeys, and he had a real empathy for Arabic culture. And it was this that must have drawn the attention of certain departments of the British government. A few months before the beginning of the First World War, Lawrence came down this narrow lane in Maliban to call on the Palestine Exploration Fund, an archaeological society that's virtually unchanged since Lawrence's day. Through here, up on the coastal plain, yeah. um, across the border. Um, well, this is the frontier between British Egypt and the Ottoman Empire, that the British had this area mapped as well. But in 1914, the Palestine Exploration Fund was also doing its bit on the side for British intelligence. This is the map that results from the expedition. This was the best map of its type for the region. The British didn't have a decent map of the border between the Ottoman Empire and British Egypt. This would be the front line if there was a war. It protected the main lines to British India. Alamey used this map here, and the Suez Canal is absolutely the crucial factor. Lawrence was selected for a small team that claimed to be looking for archaeological remains of the biblical exodus from Egypt. But in fact, the map served a military purpose. Suddenly, he finds himself involved in this. Why is he here? What's he doing? There was no doubt about it that this was intended as uh, an undercover operation using an academic organisation as a front. And in fact, Lawrence jokes about being a red herring. Yep. We even have the letter that's referring to Lawrence uh, as a, a young man who's quite shy but good at colloquial Arabic and gets on very well with the natives. He has, I think, more of the instincts of the, an explorer, but is very shy. So this is a sort of a precursor for what he's going to be doing in the revolt, where you have small teams with a few British officers, Arab supporters, on the move, being self-sufficient in a desert, which is hostile. I think without the survey, Lawrence would not have been Lawrence of Arabia. I feel that fervently. Lawrence's map covers a section of the vast Negev Desert, an area that now straddles Egypt, Israel and Jordan, an area across which he would later launch his guerrilla raids. As he worked, he was undergoing a transformation. I think that can be seen in his curious reaction to his first visit to the ancient site of Petra. And it was this exactly that Lawrence saw in 1914. He came down the scorch, arrived in this open square, and there in front of him, the most astonishing 2,000-year-old temple. The Corinthian columns at the top looking as though they were carved yesterday. He'd been an archaeologist for four years. He loved the ancient world. He loved the Middle East. And here in Petra, you would have thought everything came together. But strangely, in his account, it's not the temple he writes about, but it's this. It's about the fact that you can only get one camel down this pass. He's beginning to think more like a general and less like a historian. After all this time digging up old objects, he was beginning to realize that it was people he was more interested in 
and in this part of the world specifically the Bedouin. But secondly, it's 1914, the First World War is coming, and Lawrence isn't just an archaeologist anymore. He's here on a new expedition, financed by the Secret Service. He's changing from being a historian into a spy. So Mark Allen is one of Britain's foremost Arabists. He spent more than 30 years working for the British diplomatic service in the Middle East. I asked him why the British government would take the risk of recruiting such an eccentric person. I think when people are being recruited for public service, you're looking for conventional people who are, um, have got good formation, good education, going to behave themselves, fit in. But we all know that people like that can be a bit dull. And so there's another type that the magpie mind spots glittering in the hedge. A slightly unconventional, a little bit eccentric maybe, a bit too clever. And Lawrence's indifference to hierarchy, again, would have been attractive because he would have seen the world the other way about and that would have been helpful to them. His genius, I think that's a fair word to use of Lawrence, was to see that we wouldn't make much headway with dealing with the Arabs unless one crossed the street, walked into the crowd, and really made a self-conscious attempt to understand how it looked to them. I think Lawrence is remarkable in his ability to do that, his commitment to doing that. That made Lawrence very, very unusual. Get out! Get out! What do you think his analysis would have been of how good we are today at following through on those lessons. He would have connected with American vision of trying to make the world a better place. And I think that he would have wept with frustration at the way things are, that these fine, wonderful, very brave, very rich, competent, powerful people just don't have the language or the experience to walk into the crowd. When the First World War was declared, Lawrence was initially given a job not in the infantry in the trenches, but working in the map office for British intelligence. His particular focus was the Ottoman Empire, this amazing combination of Islamic sentiment and a Prussian-trained modern army. Lawrence was soon dispatched to the British Army's command center in Cairo, the center of their operations against the Ottoman army. And his job was to record carefully on maps the precise position of almost every Ottoman unit. He began to understand their cap badges, their specialisms, their numbers. There was almost no one in the British headquarters who could rival by this stage his knowledge of the tribal, religious, and racial mix of the Middle East. One of the reasons why someone like Lawrence is so successful is one of the only people who can describe the complexity of it. You start with Ansaria Muslims on the coast, then moving inwards, you've got Kurds. Next cut down, you start on the border with Arab Circassians, then you have Persian Ismailis, Maronite and Greek Christians on the coast, first of Sunnis, some Mutawali Shia, and right out on the edge of Mosul, you have devil-worshipping Yazidis. This threat of jihad or holy war is something we're familiar with today. But then as now, the problem was how to respond. Lawrence and his colleagues decided that the solution was to launch a counter-jihad. In order to do so, the British allied themselves with Sheriff Hussein of Mecca, a descendant of the Prophet, one of the few men with the charisma and authority to stand as a real rival to the Ottoman Sultan. Hussein wanted a vast, independent Arab empire after the war, and the British suggested that they would give it to him in return for his support.
Hussein took the British at face value and on the basis of what he thought was their promise, launched his revolt, his counter-jihad against the Ottoman Turks. However, this revolt got off to a very bad start. Sheriff Hussein and his family were beaten again and again by the modern Turkish army. And in 1916, Lawrence was dispatched from Cairo to try to find out what was going wrong. He was gonna meet the family at the center of the Arab revolt. The Emir of Mecca, Sheriff Hussein, and with him his sons, Ali, Abdullah, Faisal, and Zaid going to try to identify which one of these men could be the leader and he was hoping that he could impress them enough to attach himself to them and at last engage with the enemy finally fulfilling his dreams of doing something heroic in the deserts of Arabia. Which one do you want? This one? Yes. Ali. Hmm. In that time. Okay. Ali. <laughs> Lawrence managed to get permission to travel far into the desert, and he traveled by camel, much more elegantly, I hope, than me. You are used to this life. You can go a very long way in the desert. You don't need too much water. You're very strong. Yes. But for Lawrence, it's new for him. He doesn't, no, and course. very, very hard. He come from a Great Britain yeah. to the desert. And very That's big difference. Very hard for him. So what are the different commands for the camel? For example, if you want to go faster, like that. Lawrence learned to travel astonishing distances on a camel. He was very tough, his camels were very strong, and he could travel up to 100 miles a day, a difficult feat even for some of the Bedouin. Very good. Yeah. It's a nice camel. Horse is more comfortable. What is the problem with fighting here for you? The yeah. Bedouins, they know the area. Turkish, he didn't know. Ha -ha. He didn't know. Bedouins, he knows there is the waters there. And he go and he look for the waters and he drinks. And he will have waters. Turkish, he don't have it. Uh -huh. You don't have this experience. And also, I think maybe the people in the towns, do they support the Bedou or they support the Osmanayin? They support the Bedouins. Yes. So because they know each other. Yeah. At last, Lawrence was no longer stuck behind a desk in Cairo with his brothers fighting in the trenches. Instead, he was on his own, riding into the desert and beginning to get acquainted again with the land that he loved. At the end of his journey was Sheriff Hussein's third son, Faisal, waiting for him at Wadi Safra. And there in front of him is this man who isn't the kind of man that a British officer would expect to meet. For a start, he's clad in these elaborate robes. He has black slaves behind him. He's smoking incessantly 100 cigarettes a day. He sits up till half past three or four in the morning. I think it's Lawrence's cultural awareness, which lets him see that although this man doesn't look like a British general, this is exactly the kind of man who, through his patience, his gentleness, and his family position, is going to be able to effectively lead an Arab revolt. Lawrence described it in storybook terms. As love at first sight, he wrote, I felt at first glance that this was the man I had come to Arabia to seek. The next two years, Lawrence spent almost all his life living in Bedouin tents, and I'm spending a night with people whose fathers and grandfathers fought alongside Lawrence. And how about the Zuwaida and the Zalabani? Did, does he remember anything about this? Hmm. They are not. They're not. One of the things that Lawrence says, which is, is something it's very difficult for me not to do, is that he believes that you shouldn't ask questions. You should spend weeks or months sitting, listening to people, talking about their genealogies, talking about their families, before you ask any questions. 
Lawrence found the Bedouin with their courage, their violence, their hospitality, their dignity, their generosity, to be about as close as he could come in the modern world to his dream of living with, fighting with, working with medieval knights. We're sitting in the, the majlis, or the meeting place for Grace Sheikh, and you can see in the center of the room the coffee pot which gathers people in the evening. Looking around this room, you can see the kinds of issues he was dealing with every day. You can see first having to navigate who the most senior people in the room are. There are three sheikhs here from their respective tribes. The different ways in which people sit, not showing the soles of their feet, for example. You can see some people running prayer beads through their hands, which is generally a sign of piety. There are five people here today who are wearing pistols. And this was the kind of group that he would have been with night after night, trying to judge by looking into people's eyes who is going to be reliable, who's going to want to fight with him. It's a minefield out there, and all of it represents why what Lawrence did was so uniquely difficult. Our host's father went with Lawrence to blow up a railway station about 200 meters from here. What do people say about Lawrence as a man, as his character, as his... What do you know about Lawrence? I know that he was a man in the country. Yeah. He was an English officer mm -hmm. who served his country for a long period of time. And he worked on the country for a long period of time. He helped the Arabs in their revolt, especially uh, in, in their bombings here in the area during the revolt. Mm -hmm. uh, Lawrence, the first thing, was a man who was an Arab. So Lawrence was a friend of the Arabs. It's striking how, although many Arabs today are suspicious of Lawrence because of his colonial associations, these men whose fathers and grandfathers fought with him have picked up from their ancestors a sense of respect, a sense that he had a real sympathy for Arab people. But reading Lawrence's account of this time, it's also clear just how grueling he found these conditions. It's a pretty difficult night if you're not used to sleeping in these kind of conditions. Got about uh, 40 people sleeping in the tent with you. Children coming and going. It was so cold that on certain nights, they'd wake up and find five or six people had died from exposure during the night. It's very, very strange for a foreigner because you can never fully relax because it's not your own culture. And I think one of the reasons that Lawrence's nerves must have worn over a year or 18 months is that this tent is their home and they've got their wives and they've got their livestock and they've got their children and in the evenings they can go back to them. Whereas he, every night, is working. He's looking around the room thinking, which one of you guys is going to come on a raid with me tomorrow? Is this guy who I had an argument with yesterday, is he going to fall out? But what exactly they're thinking, I don't know. This, this sort of life, and this is, I suppose, the end of it, you can see, with these clapped out old cars and the various bits of rubble scattered through the desert, obviously that the life is changing quite dramatically. But you feel, really, a um, connection to history. <laughs> The whole question of how a Westerner can operate in what will feel like a very alien environment, how Lawrence can be in an Arab tent, in robes, drinking coffee, dealing with a very difficult language with tribal structures, all of the difficulty of that, but also perhaps even the romance of that, is something that remains pressing 80 years later for American and British troops in Iraq. Look at the smiles now. So don't, these actually, they look quite nice, huh? Yeah. They're quite good, quite it's good. Handmade, so. yeah. yeah. But this is not actually an Arab tent. This is a shipping container. Right? Yeah. This is the closest they get. Yeah. For some of them to the to the real Arab world.
American soldiers fighting today in the Middle East are not living night after night alone in Bedouin tents. They live a life which is both more protected and also more isolated from the local population. The great challenge for them, and the reason that they read Lawrence, is to try to work out how to develop those forms of cultural sensitivity, how to leave your own culture and enter an Arab one effectively. As part of this, American officers are still encouraged to read the 27 points which Lawrence wrote as a guide for British officers 90 years ago. Thousands of US Army majors have learned the story of Lawrence, and they're also shown clips from the great movie, um, uh, Lawrence of Arabia. While others travel through the earth, there's the scene of Lawrence sitting in Faisal's tent. And of course, his superior, the British uh, colonel, wants to get on with business, and Lawrence is listening. And he even finishes the recitation. And surely the future shall be better for thee than the past. And in the end shall your Lord be bounteous to thee, and thou be satisfied. It works really well. I've seen many uh, officers and NCOs who have been to Iraq and Afghanistan say, after you turn off the clip, say, that was exactly like any number of meetings I had. The interesting thing is that that discussion didn't happen in, in reality, but it's okay. The movie will work as sort of a device to get them to think about Lawrence. I mean, it's interesting. I mean, you, you open this book with Lawrence's articles. On the first page, the American officer reading this is told, learn all you can about your tribal name and Bedou. Get to know their families, clans and tribes, friends and enemies, wells, hills and roads. Bury yourself in Arab circles. Have no interests and no ideas except the work in hand, so that your brain is saturated with one thing only and you realize your part. You don't think if you're an American officer reading that, you think, well, come on. I mean, you know, I'm not going to be able to do that. None of them will ever be able to speak Arabic the way that Lawrence did. But still, I think the idea that Lawrence offers, um, the, the example, does resonate with some. But there's another reason why the US military study Lawrence. He's not just a cultural anthropologist. He was, in a sense, the first foreign insurgent. He grasped instinctively how a local population could use its position and its landscape to defeat a foreign military occupation. While his brothers were fighting on the Western Front, Lawrence was immersing himself in an alien culture and learning how a very different form of religion and nationalism could be used to pioneer a new form of guerrilla warfare. Normally, looking at a landscape like this, you just give up, because everything you would be taught at Staff College if you were a British officer would tell you that this landscape's a waste of time. An army marches on its stomach, you've got to supply it. There's no way of getting food this far into the desert. There's no water to keep people. So what's remarkable about Lawrence is that he sees all those things, all those negative things, are in fact advantages. Because this is going to be a problem for the Turks, but it's not going to be so much of a problem for the Bedouin. The Bedouin have, have lived here. The Bedouin can move 200 miles through this without needing water. This is, of course, the landscape that you can see in parts of Iraq, in parts of southern Afghanistan. And it's a landscape which is very, very difficult for a large army to move through. Armies are very dependent on roads. They're very dependent on rail networks. You can patrol this desert, but if you patrol in small numbers, you can be ambushed. And you can't garrison it because you can't resupply yourselves. So in the end, most of it is empty most of the time, and an empty space on the map is a very dangerous space.
The Ottoman Empire extended deep into the deserts of Arabia. The one thing that allowed them to supply their beleaguered garrison at Medina was their railway line. This was the only way that they could bring reinforcements or supplies. Lawrence decided to move through that desert and not to attack the fortresses or the troops, but instead to target precisely 1,100 miles of fragile, expensive line and engines in order to cut the spine of that empire. Lawrence would have been carrying about 50 pounds of gelignite, which he needed to get up and under these rails without being seen. That involved him digging out about 50 pounds of sand, placing the fuse underneath, and then trying to set the trigger. Now, the trigger was usually a rifle which had been cut off at the barrel end. As the train moves, the train pulls the trigger, at which point the barrel, which has got a big bullet in it pointing down into the sand, ignites the entire bunch of gelignite. These are the attacks which David Lean enacts so powerfully in his film. Your whole train's blown up. You've no idea what's taking place. Machine gun fire's coming in from that ridge there. You want to get behind here in order to take cover. It's at that point that Lawrence is depending on his mortar fire, which is going to come over the top and try to get them behind the train. But the whole thing is black smoke everywhere. Noise everywhere, pistons exploding, people screaming, trains falling off on either side. And this whole area around us is littered with sick and dying and wounded soldiers. It's complete carnage. And although Lawrence tries to put a brave face on it, he writes to friends saying, we had a good show, we managed to get it, it was just like the Wild West. In another letter to the friend, he says, I cannot bear the killing. I cannot bear the sight of these dead men. In many dangerous spots, the Turks would send out patrols in front of their trains, and they would walk 15 people in front of the train to stop them from blowing it up. It was a complete disaster. Understandably, nobody wanted to get on this train anymore. By the end of 1917, passengers on the Damascus-Medina line are paying extra to sit in the third-class carriages at the back of the train, rather than the first-class carriages up near the engine. And a lot of it was to do with terror. It was terrorism, because they would put huge signs up in the train station Damascus anonymously at night, saying, no good Arabs should get on this train. If you get on this train, we'll blow you up. Very, very similar to what terrorists will do today in Iraq, what they'll do today in Britain. It's to do with trying to ensure not just that you do the damage, but that you scare people into believing you're going to do future damage. Lawrence was an insurgent. In today's language, the Turks would have regarded him as a terrorist. I think he would have understood what the Taliban were up to, instinctively and objectively on account of his own experience. He wouldn't have any difficulty with that at all. Little wonder then that when the US military were trying to fight insurgents in Iraq and Afghanistan, they turned back to the writings of Lawrence and saw him as a voice for this kind of insurgency. General David Petraeus, who was the American commander in Iraq and is now the commander in Afghanistan, devised a whole new counterinsurgency doctrine, a new field manual, a lot of which draws on Lawrence's writings. One of the co-authors of this was John Nagel, Downloaded more than a million times in the first month after it was published. Copies found in Taliban training camps in Pakistan. So we know our enemies are reading it. Now we just have to get our guys to do it. Lawrence was trying to sap the strength of the Ottoman 
empire. He attacked their logistics. He refused to provide them with, with a set-piece battle, which he knew they would win. And, and instead, he, he would inflict the, the death of a thousand cuts. And he actually felt sorry for the conventional army he fought. He said he, he compared it to a plant. It, it, it's rooted firmly. It, it has these long lines of supply. It can't move rapidly. And and by comparison, an insurgent is a vapor. An insurgent can disappear at will. Seven, six, it is enormously difficult for a conventional army designed to, to confront another conventional army to fight against a, an immaterial vapor. Lawrence actually was using uh, guerrilla tactics and techniques to create a small army of guerrilla fighters to some extent in Afghanistan that the Taliban is following Lawrence's precepts more precisely. Are we right that in this sense, he's on the side of the enemy? To succeed in this kind of war, you need to be someone who thinks a little bit outside the box, to use a horribly overused American phrase. You, you have to be willing to connect with the people you're fighting who are also the people you're fighting with. The fundamental challenge for the US forces and their allies in Iraq and Afghanistan are to work with local forces. Lawrence was in the center of an Arab army. He was building the capacity of local troops. Night after night, as he crossed this stony wilderness, he was trying to bring together feuding Arab tribes into a single national fighting force. So Lawrence stops here for the night on his way from Wadi Rum on an attack on a Turkish train station. This is the carpet of brown flints that he describes over a lime scrag. He started the day with about 100 people, and they're all fighting. There's the Zubaida tribe, the Zalabani tribe, some Hawaitas have joined them. He's running back and forth between these different groups, discussing pay, spoils, Who's going to ride first? Come night, they stop, and there are three little groups around tamarisk fires, and he's delighted because the day started with 10 different groups, and he's managed to get them to combine into three. But if he's really going to create a new Arab nation, he's got to get them into one. Lawrence's military genius faced its greatest test at the beginning of 1917. His aim was to work with Auda Abu Tayy, one of the most famous Bedouin warriors in Arabia, a man who couldn't count the number of people that he'd killed. Together with Auda, he decided, without asking permission or even informing his bosses, to head for Aqaba, the Turkish Ottoman port that controlled the Red Sea. It was an astonishing journey, beginning with 17 or 18 peoples through this remote area of desert. All the skills, his sense of insurgency, his feeling for the tribes came together, as historian Michael Asher, who served in the SAS, explained to me. It was really the classic special forces operation because they made this incredible turning movement through the hardest desert in Arabia. Uh, there's one area called al hu which means the terror, literally, where there's you know, not a single blade of grass, not a single tree, not even flies could live there. The reason he did that was it was a feint. If he'd made straight towards Aqaba, the Turks would have realized immediately that that's, that was his objective. And just a handful of men, only 17 to start off with, no heavy weapons, they then set about recruiting local people. This is the hearts and minds uh, technique of special forces. And they eventually became 500. All special forces really go back to Aqaba, to that operation. The fighting, which in David Lean's film takes place on the Aqaba beaches, in fact took place 60 miles inland, here at Abdelissen.
this was the key point. The Turks here controlled the pass, going down into the Guerra Plain. So he who controlled the pass really controlled Aqaba. But it was the topography that really was the key to the battle because the Turks were down in the depression that we can see here. Lawrence's men were up on the high ground. Basically, the, the Arabs had them pinned down in this hollow. At the end of the day, after sniping at them virtually the whole day, Lawrence got a bit fed up with the Huaytat and he said to Auda Abu Tai, uh, how is it with the Huaytat? All talk and no work. And Auda, who was very you know, sensitive to these uh, pricks against his honor, uh, turned absolutely pale and he marched off. And the next minute, Lawrence saw this horde of Huaytat um, horsemen charging down into the valley. And he very quickly followed on his camel. But just at the crucial moment, he shot his own camel through the head with his pistol and ended up sailing through the air and hit the ground, lost consciousness. And when he came round, the whole thing was over. He'd won one of the most crucial ports in the Middle East. And in an instant, this map maker from a desk at Cairo with his romantic army had created a legend and proved the worth of the Arab forces. And the theory of the SAS is that if you get the right man, you can do anything. If you get people like Lawrence who can really understand the way Arabs think, you know, and really see the world as they see it, then you could do it. But it, of course, it's very difficult to find those kind of people. And that's why I think Lawrence was so special. It wasn't enough for Lawrence to capture this important strategic port because, of course, British headquarters underestimated the Arabs. He needed now to communicate their victory back to Cairo. There were no telephones, no telegraph. The only way to do it was to take the news personally, by camel, across the Sinai to Suez, and then to Cairo. Now, Lawrence had to do that himself because he realized that if he sent someone, he wouldn't be, no one would believe him because this wasn't an authorized operation. Nobody knew where Lawrence was. Where had he been for all these weeks? Nobody knew. So if an Arab had turned up and said, we've captured Aqaba, no one would have believed him. Lawrence knew he had to do it in person. So he set off on this epic ride across uh, Sinai. When Lawrence had left Cairo six months earlier, he'd been a junior British officer in British military uniform. Nobody had heard from him in two months. And during his time with the Bedouin, he'd changed into a very different person on that tough journey back across Sinai. He was traveling back to the British military headquarters, the headquarters in Cairo, and a world which he must half have forgotten. When Lawrence staggered exhausted after that heroic ride into the edge of the British base in Cairo, he somehow managed to get in to see General Allenby. The contrast between Allenby, a cavalry officer, tall, a product of the Victorian army in his polished riding boots, and as Lawrence says of himself, a little silk-robed, barefooted man offering to hobble the enemy couldn't have been more dramatic. And yet it was a meeting of minds. Allenby immediately decided to provide armored cars, machine guns, mortars, and compasses to help the Arab cause. Allenby could see that a man like Lawrence was exactly the person who could form the right wing of his army, lead them against the Ottoman Turks. For Lawrence, however, a different kind of challenge was emerging. He suddenly had two masters, Allenby and Faisal. He was hoping he could win a victory for General Allenby and for the British, and for Faisal, an independent Arab kingdom. All of this, of course, was going to depend on what was decided in Britain. Would the British government keep its promise to give the Arabs the independence and freedom, to give the Arabs the respect and the autonomy that Lawrence felt they deserved? While Lawrence was continuing his fight in the deserts of Arabia, far away, back in Whitehall, the British and the French had in fact secretly decided to betray the Arabs. And instead of giving Faisal an independent kingdom, 
to divide Arabia up into British and French colonies. The French negotiator in all of this was Georges Picot. The British negotiator was Sir Mark Sykes. Together, they decided to divide Arabia into two imperial possessions. I talked to historian James Barr about the significance of the Sykes-Picot agreement. The reason Sykes was brought in as an expert was because he'd written a book on the, the Ottoman Empire just before the war. And if you look in the index of that book, which Sykes wrote, he has an entry for Arab character, and it says, Arab character, see also treachery. And that was Sykes's view. It was a deal done to carve up the Middle East between these two empires, between Britain and France. What it did was divide the Middle East along a diagonal line that ran from the Mediterranean coast up to the Persian border, from the E of Acre to the last K in Kirkuk, right. which gives you this wonderful idea of you know, how it was designed on a map. There was no, uh, it bore no relation to geography or to ethnicity or religion. It was simply a line on the map. It was a very complacent and uh, arrogant thing to do. It was dividing up a land that neither of them yet ran. Uh, and one of the British officials in the war office said it's a bit like uh, being hunters who divided up the skin of the bear before we have killed it. So Lawrence knew that the British and French were actually planning to divide Arabia up into colonies. How do you think this felt for Lawrence to have to be with the Arabs, to promise them this kind of freedom? while knowing that the same thing had been promised in other directions at the same time. He's absolutely appalled, and he writes a note to his commanding officer deep in the, when he's deep in the desert saying, we are getting them to fight for us on a lie and I can't stand it. The Sykes-Picot Agreement is the deal that's seldom discussed in Britain today. But the Arabs have certainly not forgotten it because it was a treaty that betrayed all the promises that Lawrence and the British government had made to the Arabs. And worse, something that was gonna haunt Middle Eastern politics for decades to come. When Osama bin Laden talks about the nature of his mission, when he thinks about Lawrence of Arabia, he thinks about the betrayal of Sykes-Picot and calls it in his words, the dissection of the Islamic world into fragments. Next, I want to show how Lawrence tries to reverse the injustice of Sykes-Picot, how he tries to use his fame and his military glory to win a fair settlement for the Arabs, and how the legacy of that conflict destroyed both Lawrence and our future relations with the Middle East. And Professor Stewart examines how Lawrence's attempts to address the injustices fell and what the consequences were here on BBC4 tomorrow at the slightly later time of 11. In a moment, Lucy Worsley delves back in time to the Victorians' fascination with murder. <laughs>